Good morning, colleagues. Um, this is Nico Koopman speaking, the Vice Rector for Social Impact Transformation and Personnel. It is great to welcome you here at our staff assembly, a really historic staff assembly. It is the first time that we meet in virtual fashion in COVID time. And um, we remember our last assembly was in normal, so-called normal fashion in February. But we are really welcome that, uh, we're glad that we can meet today in this fashion. Uh, most of us has become used to doing it in, in this way. We will do some practical arrangements, but before we get there, we would like just to observe a moment of silence. Uh, as you know, this is a time where we think about beloved that we have lost, people who have passed on. We think about colleagues who have passed on in this time. We think about family members, friends, dear ones, and in remembering them and in expressing solidarity with those who mourn, we observe a moment of silence. Exhibaya danki an i. Ons het enkele praktische reelings. As i wil specifiek dan ook kyk na die onderskrifte wat beskikbaar is, vertaling wat beskikbaar is, dan kan i gerust kyk, i sien daar rechtsboe, daar is specifieke ikoon waar i kan druk en i kan dan onderskrifte volg. So we communicate to you that we have translation facility in the form of uh, the subscripts that we have available. And please just use on the, that specific on the right hand side, to the circle that you see top right on your screen. We will, after the input from each member of the rectorate, have a Q&A session, a discussion session, right at the end. Uh, we have allocated about 15 minutes for that purpose. Uh, our rector will specifically lead that specific session of discussion and questions. You may submit questions or inputs that you want to make at that specific uh, email address that you see there, ecoms at sun.ac.za and then the questions will be posted in the column on the right of your screen and then the specific also uh, you can look at the icon with a question mark to follow uh, the discussions uh, in the columns. Then. And then we also commit ourselves to send responses to questions after the meeting, questions that we cannot deal with during the meeting, we will then deal with afterwards. Colleagues, just a quick look at the program that we will follow. Uh, we, we will start with our rector and thereafter Prof. Quinwinkel, our Vice Rector for Learning and Teaching, then our Registrar, Dr. Ronel Retief, after her, Prof. Eugene Kluter, our Vice Rector for Research, Innovation and Postgraduate Studies, and then our DVC, Vice Rector for Strategy and Internationalization, Prof. Esther Klopper, then myself, and then the Rector will deal with and lead and facilitate the question and answer and discussion session, and the Rector will also conclude. This is then our menu. For the next hour, colleagues, I gladly hand to our Rector, Prof. Um, de Villiers. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Prof. Nico. And morning, everyone. It's uh, really get to, good to get together, even if it is only in, in, in cyberspace and not on, on campus. 
So I, I really miss you folks. Um, but as you can see, we are I'm still working from home, like most of us. Um, and cabin fever does set in from time to time, and it's good to get out sometimes. But we absolutely, we have to do what is necessary to stop the spread of coronavirus. And uh, this too will pass. All of us, we will get back to campus eventually. Um, but speaking of which, uh, things have been uh, rather quiet on, on, on campus lately. Uh, but I suppose, I guess, the one good thing is that we are unlikely to get uh, any questions about uh, parking today. But uh, in all seriousness now, when the coronavirus crisis hit, uh, we had to find ways of carrying on with our important work as a research intensive public university. Uh, and this, in fact, is a, is a challenge that is facing uh, the whole of, of our sector. Um, but along with the rest of society, uh, higher education has really been severely disrupted by COVID-19. Uh, contact tuition was suspended uh, in the middle towards the end of March. And that then really left us with two overriding priorities, and that's one, is to save the academic year. It's a priority of successfully completing academic year 2020. And then furthermore, is to ensure uh, institutional sustainability. So I'm gonna expand a little bit more on that. The first thing that we did was to set up a COVID-19 contingency committee, and that was done in February. In March, that was expanded to an overarching institutional committee for business con Continuity, ICBC, is led by uh, our Chief Operating Officer, Professor Stan Dupressi, who unfortunately cannot join us at this meeting today because he's attending another meeting. As I'm sure many of you are aware, we are with lots of teams and Zoom meetings going on. But the ICBC has seven work streams, as you can see on this slide, that, uh, and these work streams cover various aspects of the university, each led by a member of top management. There's also a medical advisory committee. And I must say this arrangement has worked very well, allowing us to act in unison as an institution. Faculties have been kept in the loop via meetings with deans, and there's also a regular liaison with other, other structures, uh, faculty managers, and I have been really impressed by how well things have been coordinated to not only actually keep Stellenbosch University going, but actually doing very well in many respects. So, for example, I'm very proud of how our university uh, community is rallying in response to the coronavirus. If we can have the next slide. Um, and this, it it's, uh, ranges from hundreds of Tiger Martys volunteering to serve on the front line, as you can see on the screen here in the collage of the selfies at the top, and to, to very many multidisciplinary coronavirus related research projects and activities that unfold across the, that have been unfolding across the various faculties. Just one example at the bottom on the screen there is Quinton, the robot that's deployed at Tigerberg Hospital allowing specialists to do ward rounds uh, remotely. Next. But a, a key factor during this crisis has been the need for effective, uh, clear communication. And thanks to colleagues in corporate communication and marketing for, I wanna thank them for creating a dedicated COVID-19 page on our website, regular mass mailers to staff and students, SMSs, voice notes, instant messages, social media, lots of external media work as well, press releases, interviews, and actually, uh, according to the media monitoring agency PEAR, Stellenbosch University has generated the highest number of news clips of South African universities so far this year. We've also examples of thought leadership through op-eds, and a very exciting new development that I really encourage you to listen to, podcasts uh, entitled Talks at Stellenbosch Uni. Next uh, uh, is also 
uh, an example of how this crisis has actually brought out the best in us. Our division of social impact uh, collaborated with various partners to support local initiatives, including the municipality and provincial government departments. SU co-established Stellenbosch Unite, a collaborative movement that distributes food to vulnerable households. Our campus health service assisted with telephonic screening, planning and protocols. And Marty's FM was used to distribute COVID-19 information to the community. The Telematic Schools Project, TSP, continued with broadcasts to learners and the SABC and ETV also started airing some of our lessons. So I think that's a great example of purposeful partnerships and inclusive networks in action. We also reached out to the SU community and the general public for support. So development and alumni relations devised a fundraising campaign with five key areas that you can see on the screen. So I really wanna thank all staff members who donated and thank you for helping your university to make a difference. A highlight in this period was that we still managed to award qualifications. Our graduation ceremonies could not take place during lockdown, but we had our first ever virtual conferral of qualifications that took place on the 3rd of April. You can find the video on, on, uh, on, the, on YouTube. A record haul of 9,120 qualifications were awarded in the 2019 academic year, 361 PhDs, and this is up by more than 15% from 2015 when I started my first term. So I think we, you all, we all, we can be proud of the significant contribution to progress and development that we are making in this way, not only in our country, but also on the rest of our continent and further. And it speaks to who we are, and what we do, it speaks to the Stellenbosch University brand. And as you know, we have been looking at our brand positioning for some time now. We are in the process of refreshing our visual identity. You would have received communication about this in the recent, uh, recent past. We are proceeding with this important initiative. We have already approved a new brand positioning strategy and a new brand positioning narrative. What we are now working on is a refreshed visual identity that is aligned with Vision 2040, and it's also grounded in our proposed visual redress policy. But there's been a firm decision to migrate to a uniform visual identity, uniform visual identity that ends the proliferation of the current 170 plus logos that we have in use. We will be sticking to maroon as our primary institutional color. It will be supported by gold as a, as a secondary color. And we will retain our current institutional slogan, Sam to forward together, Marsilie Pambile, because this is exactly what we've done during this crisis. We've gone forward together. I really want to thank you all for your sacrifice and your hard week work colleagues. Let's let's not beat about the bush. It's been tough. But nevertheless, we've made good progress despite the challenges. And I really want to thank you very sincerely from the bottom of my heart. Thank you very much. I'm very proud to be part of the team Stellenbosch University. It has been a tremendous team effort. Everyone has contributed from lecturers who've had to repackage their courses, students who suddenly yeah. had to get used to exclusive online class attendance and assessments, experts, IT experts who had to upgrade overloaded systems in record time, and managers who have tirelessly found ways to keep things going, come what may. So, and my colleagues will expand on that, uh, and I'm now handing over to Professor Arnold Schoenwinkel. Thank you. Good morning, colleagues. It's good to meet in this fashion. And I would love to tell you about what is happening in the learning and teaching space uh, in which all of you are particip participating in some way or another. So if you can have the first slide, please, uh, Desmond. 
you will know that there's much happening in the arena of space travel and spacecraft with SpaceX's um, interesting achievements the last few days, and I use that as a backdrop theme for which uh, for what I'd like to talk to you about um, in a moment. I'm just waiting for Desmond to display the first slide and we can get going. Almost there. There we go. Great. Colleagues, I think 2020 will be remembered as the year that Stellenbosch University's learning and teaching was blasted into cyberspace. Here we see Prof. Richard Stevens lecturing from his home, and here we see one of our students, Tanya Chiza, studying at home, all of that happening in the form of emergency remote learning teaching assessment. If we can have the next slide, please. We are all on what I will call Odyssey, 2020 into the unknown. On 27 March, as the rector said, the COVID-19 Big Bang flung our students off campus and our staff out of offices and out of the lecture halls. The academic project was an admission to a foreign universe of emergency remote learning, teaching and assessment. Fortunately, we built parts of the spacecraft before with the SU Council's investment in ICT for learning and teaching since 2014. We are all involved in this together. And we did a lot of work to prepare our staff for this era of remote learning, teaching and assessment. During the extended April break, lecturers had to redesign all of their module guides and adapt their pedagogy to online learning and teaching. Staff from the Division of Learning and Teaching Enhancement created many resources for online learning and teaching and offered webinars almost every day, which were very well attended. From Monday to the 20th of April, every home became a recording studio and every home a control center to launch their lectures and to manage problems. Private and work life inextricably blended. We have a deep empathy with staff for the anxiety and the strain they are experiencing. We are all building this spacecraft while we are flying an extremely stressful mission. We also had to prepare our students for emergency remote learning, teaching and assessment. SU's collective aim is, as the rector said, to leave no student behind and make a success of this academic year. More than 1,700 loan laptops were couriered to their homes all over South Africa, and data bundles were provided for access to learning material. SU online resources were created to help students with the discipline of studying remotely. Staff went the extra mile to give students who had to remain in residence and others whose families face economic hardships due to COVID-19, much extra support. Students are under tremendous stress as well, but showed a remarkable resilience and adaptability to online learning. Admittedly, it has not always been a smooth journey, and they are missing out on the rich experience of being on our Stellenbosch University campuses. Here in the image that you see on the right-hand side is one of our students who remained back on campus to study here, Kolive Gani Wanina. We're going to have the next slide, please. So what about semester two and beyond? Yes, we are experiencing some challenges, but I think the slogan per Astra at Astra is very applicable. Some 20% of our students are now back on our campuses for essential practical and clinical work. For semester two, most of the learning teaching still has to remain online due to the Department of Higher Education and Training's physical distancing regulations. Fully online learning is not ideal, but SU had no other options to save this academic year. I experience that everyone is offering their best quality that they can. A lot of appreciation has indeed been received from parents and students alike. Much experience has been gained in the process and resources which create, were created for fully online learning, teaching and assessment. I believe that this will enable Stellenbosch University 
to find an optimal balance between face-to-face -face and online for hybrid learning in our future. Thank you. Thank you very much to every faculty and past member who collaborated so closely last quarter and for the year, for the rest of this year to make our academic project a success. I believe that together we shall safely land mission 2020. I thank you for that. I wish you the best for the semester ahead. And I now would like to hand over to Dr. Renel Retef, our registrar. Thank you, Prof. Skwenwinkel. And thank you, colleagues, for this opportunity. As you are probably aware, universities are allowed to bring back a maximum of 33% of the student population to their respective campuses. Over the past few weeks, our main focus was bringing back these students. We have two parallel processes to identify students who may return. The first entailed that faculties identified programs and modules that could not be completed successfully without students having access to laboratories, specialized material or software, or participating in invigilated sit-down exams. The second is an application process conducted by Student Affairs, whereby students with barriers to study from home can apply to return to campus. We have just opened a second round for these applications. You can see... Hi, good morning, uh, colleagues. Goedemorgen, uh, collega's. Uh, baie dankie dat ek uh, paar woorde kan sê. Uh, it's been a, a very busy time for all of us. Uh, and what I would want to do in the next few minutes is to give you a few highlights in terms of what is happening in the research uh, environment. So um, I was very worried uh, when we started going online that with all the time uh, that would be consumed in doing online teaching, and it did consume a huge amount of time, that uh, the research effort would actually lag behind. And some of that, it was very interesting that as soon as we uh, started going into lockdown, we started with a survey uh, to determine um, what we are, were doing in terms of research for impact, and specifically in terms of the COVID-19 response. We then discovered that we were already busy with 47 research projects related to COVID-19. Unfortunately, the few minutes I have uh, will not do justice uh, to go into any of these projects. What you see there are just two examples, the Tiger Marty's 3D print protective gear uh, in fight against COVID-19 and also uh, a study uh, to determine the economic impact uh, of, um, the, uh, of the lockdown. But subsequent to that, there was a special call that I put out for funding of new projects uh, related to COVID-19. And we received uh, another 50 odd uh, applications and we were able to fund 15 of these projects which are ongoing uh, at the moment. So. It's been, in a way, difficult to keep the momentum, but nevertheless, uh, a lot is going on in the research and innovation domain. I would also like to uh, remind you to have a look uh, at our newer report, the new research report, which is now uh, available uh, on the website. So please um, uh, have a look at that. I also uh, am happy to report that the library uh, is back uh, in operation. Uh, also that the central analytical facility uh, is fully operational again. Uh, so these are very important uh, activities that we had to restart uh, as we moved on uh, during lockdown. I want to say something very briefly about the School for Climate Studies. The good news there. Uh, is that the uh, constitution of the school was approved by the Academic Planning Committee just recently, and that is on its way to Senate, and we hope that the school will be established and launched later on uh, in this year. 
I want to also say a few things about the NSTF Awards. Again, good news. Uh, we had 10 finalists this year. And at the award ceremony last week, we had three winners. Uh, the first is uh, Professor Conrad Mattia and Dr. Sarah Andreotti in the Faculty of Science that won the award for the Shark Safe Barrier. Dr. Richard Walls uh, in the Faculty of Engineering won the Young Researcher Award. And Professor Christine Lochner in Psychiatry uh, won the award in the Researcher category for raising awareness about uh, obsessive uh, compulsive uh, disorder. We are very fortunate also to have received the news last Friday that three of our centers of excellence, whose 15 year term had come to an end uh, this year, uh, will be funded for the next three years uh, to reposition themselves uh, as they uh, move forward. And this is the Center for Invasion Biology, the Center for uh, Tuberculosis Research, and also the National Institute for Theoretical Physics. So that's good news. It will not be at the same level, unfortunately, but nevertheless, um, we can continue. So more good news is that we were also awarded a uh, capacity building uh, award from ARUA, the Alliance of Research Universities in Africa, uh, our center of excellence there, which we uh, successfully launched earlier this year, uh, will receive 12 million rand over a two year period, and this will be focusing uh, on capacity building. In conclusion, uh, it's all well with our postdoctoral fellows. Uh, all of them have returned uh, to campus, uh, especially those that need laboratory facilities to conduct their research. Uh, seven of our 321 postdoctoral fellows had to return back home, uh, which they have done, but they will continue there, uh, and we are trying to find a host for them at, in their countries, and they will now become our first joint postdoctoral fellows. We also are looking at uh, filling the gap. All of you will know that the NRF bursary uh, policy yeah. and the number of bursaries that they have made available, that that has gone down uh, quite substantially. Um, and we are taking a proposal to the Committee for Bursary and Loans next week uh, to see whether the university can make good uh, some of that shortfall uh, which we anticipate. So colleagues from my side, a uh, huge appreciation uh, for the work uh, that you have done, for continuing with the supervision of your postgraduate students, for making plans uh, as is necessary, and uh, for delivering uh, on the research, innovation, and postgraduate uh, project uh, of the university. And with those uh, words, uh, I would like to hand over uh, to Professor Esther uh, um, Esther said it was OK. My sincere apologies for uh, the uh, breakdown in communication. Uh, I suppose we can't have a virtual meeting without also experiencing uh, what we experience in our team meetings every day. So I wanted to really just thank everybody that worked tirelessly to facilitate the process of our returning students in the faculties as well as in the various path environments. This was a huge team effort and we're looking now at the newcomer first year applications and the provisional office for 2021. So looking ahead, I'm happy to report that we've seen an increase of 12% in our applications for next year's intake and we have already made 7% more offers to these applicants than at the same time last year. This is also the reason that we have not formally extended our closing date for applications, although we have processed late applications of meritorious applicants on an ad hoc basis. Next slide, please. You are all acutely aware of the uncertainties that we are dealing with at present. So in terms of planning for the start of 2021, we have appointed working groups to plan for various scenarios. We have learned this week that the final metric results will become available on 23 February next year. And I'm happy to say that we have in fact already started grappling with a scenario that would allow for a first year intake in March. So at least we now know for the moment, at least, that we can focus our energy on this scenario. 
We are also thinking about our admission requirements and how to be agile if we need to adapt based on the metric results as they become available next year. We are also anticipating that our first years of 2021 might be differently prepared than their predecessors. And we, are, uh, we have a working group engaging across the university on the kinds of support that these newcomers might need when they arrive. And then we are also trying to understand the challenges that the current grade 11s are facing at present and how this might impact on our 2022 intake. You'll know that one of our rector's favorite Yogi Berra quotes is, if you get to the fork in the road, take it. For me, this is particularly relevant at the moment as we have to move forward in the midst of many uncertainties knowing that we might make mistakes or end up with imperfect solutions at times. So I really want to thank all of you for moving forward together and taking the fork in the road with us on this journey. Thank you. And I now hand over to Professor Klopper. Thank you, colleagues. Uh, thank you, and uh, this is indeed uh, an honour to uh, address our colleagues in, in this manner this uh, morning. Um, in this time available to me, I would like to focus on the initiatives in internationalisation during the COVID uh, period. With restrictions uh, and uh, during the lockdown period, especially the ban on international travel, our international efforts have indeed become more challenging to manage. It is in the midst of the pandemic that we have had to find ways to continue, for example, student mobility, our engagement with partner universities, and our program and conferences had gone virtual. So I want to share with you um, some of the, the uh, activities that we have deliberately uh, engaged with in terms of our internationalization. The first challenge we had was in terms of international semester students of our university that uh, were abroad. And for those students, uh, we had to find ways of engaging them. Uh, there were regular updates, uh, online group check-in sessions that were held with them. And then uh, Stellenbosch University International continuously were involved with external stakeholders and discussing with them, for example, that our student, in terms of our student safety, like DIRCO, IHASA, the Department of Higher Education. Now, I need to um, share this with you, and that is that our colleagues at SUI were very effective in the, in, in the sense that they knew where each and every one of the Stellenbosch students were placed. Our second challenge was then uh, in terms of our partner universities and international uh, semester students that were here at Stellenbosch. And with this, we also followed very clear communication updates. It was on our website, SunLearn, and we made sure that there was an uh, alignment between the communication we gave to students um, and those that they received from the, from the home institutions. Uh, the unfortunate part was that students from our partner universities who, who applied to attend here at Stellenbosch University for our second semester were unfortunately unable to start with face-to-face -face classes and a large group of the students then decided to defer the exchanges to 2021, but a small group did decide to continue with online courses. Uh, now, although it's a small number, this does provide us with the opportunity to now explore what uh, virtual mobility might look like in the future. The annual winter school that we offer through SUI unfortunately had to be cancelled but we are working on plans to make sure that uh, we will be able to offer a summer school and hopefully this will happen in December, January this year. The third issue I want to highlight is our engagement with partner universities. 
So in May, I sent out a communique to all the VCs and DVCs of Stellenbosch's partner universities. And the purpose was really to communicate our contribution uh, that we have made towards both our teaching and uh, research, research activities during COVID. And we also clearly communicated the measures we took in terms of ensuring the safety and support of, of international students. And I've had very good feedback regarding the communique and it, it provided an opportunity to be connected um, at a senior level also with our partner universities. The last aspect I want to share with you is that of our virtual internationalization. Uh, since the outbreak of the pandemic, various international efforts had to continue online. For example, we were planning uh, some conferences and, and the, the question was, do we really cancel them or do we continue? So as you will see on this slide, one of, of the initiatives that, that we continue, that we were very um, pleased that we could continue is the Africa Doctoral Academy uh, we had to cancel the autumn school in March, but then we transformed into a, a virtual learning space. And uh, now during the July uh, period, we offered this online, uh, five different courses through ABA, uh, and there were more than 100 participants. So what we've seen is that this is a very successful uh, manner and operation that we can now continue in conjunction with University of Lagos, Rwanda, Strathmore, um, and STIAS is involved in uh, working towards an emerging scholarship initiative that we will be offering remotely. The other is that our colleagues at SUI has also been involved in co-hosting webinars with our international partners like the Disaster Risk Reduction Water Sciences, and they've collaborated with the research contract department in a virtual presentation of challenges to internationalization, administration and research co cooperation. And this formed part of the Hamburg virtual network meeting. And then uh, on my last slide, you will see that uh, it was an initiative that started off a year ago, the planning phase and uh, the issue I staff and specifically our Center for Partnership and Internationalization Support worked with the Association of Commonwealth Universities and the, the Peace and Reconciliation Network. Here on our campus, Professor Pumla Gaboda Marikazela is, is, is the represent, re, representative of the network. Uh, we co-hosted then with the ACU this virtual conference in arts and peace and reconciliation, a transnational perspective, and this happened in June. So a very positive development and connection opportunities with experts around the world. And this is what we will continue to do to find ways of connecting, supporting our students, virtual mobility and virtual connections um, as we, we seek ways of how we can expand on our online offering. So in conclusion, I want to acknowledge that while we have done much to continue our international efforts, under the current circumstances, there are challenges and frustrations. Uh, we are constantly working and finding ways to ensure our continued engagement with partner universities and, and this asks for creativity and innovation. Uh, but as uh, Winston Churchill said, the pessimist sees difficulty in every opportunity and the optimist sees opportunity in very every difficulty. And I'm optimistic that the post pandemic era will provide us with opportunities and together we will be able to step up to the challenge. So on that note, over to my colleague Nico Koopman. Thank you, colleague. <coughs> Colleagues, I will briefly speak about uh, some human resources facets and also specifically health and well-being uh, aspects. So I would like us to move to the slide, which indicates that we are in a time of intensification. During World War II, the well-known public scholar C.S. Lewis 
spoke at the University of Oxford to staff and students, and he described their time of war as a time of the intensification of existing concerns and really to even a higher level this time of our, of this pandemic is a time of the intensification of the risks that we face the risk to lose your life and your livelihood uh, uh, also an intensification of the uncertainty and insecurity with which we so-called normally live an intensification of unpredictability and disorientation, uh, an intensification of the threat to our sense of purpose and meaning, an intensification in the time of social distancing, of, of social isolation and, and social alienation. Uh, one of our deans write to me, wrote to me earlier this week and said, listen, we really, especially in the second semester, need to think more explicitly about ways that we can counter the threat of social isolation and social alienation. Some people even say we mustn't speak about social distancing because it becomes social alienation. We must rather consider speaking about physical distancing. And so when we assemble and commune like this as a staff, it's one concrete expression of we are not going to give over to isolation, social isolation, social and social alienation, which can lead also to a lack of social solidarity. And then, of course, it's a time of the that we experience the intensification of societal concerns, poverty, hunger, also unemployment, uh, various so-called social pathologies we see intensify and we're even hurt and saddened and angered by an intensification in these days of corruption. So on the one in the time of intensification, but on the next slide, I indicate that it is also a time of innovation. It's a time where we think in new ways about the Stellenbosch University values with a great acronym that the rector gave to us, E-Care. Uh, we want to be, we strive for excellence, compassion, accountability, respect and equity. And we emphasize in these days compassion in some of the communiques that we send out regarding staff wellness and well-being, uh, the notion of compassion is continuously uh, emphasized. So what we did, colleagues, uh, in these days is to upgrade the health and well-being measures of the university, the health and well-being practices. And here, Campus Health Service plays a crucial role. We upgraded our employment assistance program, and there's counseling electronically, mentoring, coaching services, webinars available, informal support groups, and then we have a new website also, StaffNet on the SU website, where we really have exciting uh, information guidelines available, and we encourage you to visit that website. We also, you would have seen in these days, uh, looked at new ways looked in new ways at the HR measures. Uh, we want to be more flexible, more decentralized, and also more contextual. And one of our defaults in the HR measures is that we use as point of departure a default of trust in our staff. Stellenbosch University is a high performing university. And when we have measures like performance management, its point of departure is trust in your staffs, trust in our colleagues. So we looked at new performance management uh, measures. Uh, we also specifically dealt with the different categories of, of staff, the situations in which staff are due to the nature of their work. The nature of the work of some is that they are really overworked at this time. Others feel, sure, I cannot continue with my work due to the nature of the work and I feel 
almost feel redundant and I feel anxious about that. And we sent out a specific communique. We, we studied the different categories and we tried to see guidelines uh, regarding those categories. And you have received a communique which give guidance regard, regarding that specific challenge. Also regarding leave, we have sent out some directives uh, 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 and we're thinking about leave arrangements afresh also this coming Friday. We will have a meeting again about that. And then guidelines for meeting management that we have meeting management that really in this challenging time uh, take the health and well-being of our staff into consideration. And coming Friday, our work stream for staff will look also at email practices. We received concrete suggestions from our colleagues to really look at <laughs> email practices that advance health and well-being. And besides these measures, colleagues, we uh, have to continue with the so-called normal tasks, uh, think creatively about it, and specifically through a COVID lens. I think this COVID lens will be with us and we will have to look at the future continuously through that lens. Let me conclude. On the next slide, you will see a picture that's in my normal office. That's the office uh, in Edmund B. There's a photo of Madiba and Wimbeers no dear two of the South African moral heroes, one can say. You will see that Madiba is very fragile. He, at that stage, couldn't walk alone anymore. Wimbe is in the wheelchair. But the interesting thing about this photo is that amidst their frailty, they could be mobile. They could go forward, but they could only go forward in togetherness. And colleagues, we are in highly, highly vulnerable times. But together, in interdependence, in communion with each other, we can go forward. I now give over to our rector, who will deal with the two final sessions of discussion and conclusion. Yeah, uh, thank you very much. Um, Nico and colleagues for uh, taking us through some of these many initiatives that we have ongoing at the university during COVID. So it's now time for uh, questions and, and answers. Uh, and the technical team has, um, so I will either deal with some myself or I will direct them as I, as I deem appropriate. Uh, the technical team has fielded some of these uh, questions and has sifted them through uh, to me. Some of the others we will uh, deal with uh, all of the questions and the things that you've put in the in the uh, Q and A uh, in the uh, questions box will be addressed. So please do not do not fear. So um, the first question, a couple of them are addressed to Prof Nico, uh, and these are HR questions. It's regarding the uh, three things I'm, I'm, I will put there. Is one is the status of the HR uh, system review process uh, that has been underway for a while now. Uh, the second one is on the uh, leave issue. I think many of our uh, ad academics and past staff are certainly concerned about leave arrangements. And the third one is what about the progress with, uh, with regards to uh, uh, daycare? that has certainly been in the making for quite a while. Nico, if you could address those questions. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I will start with the daycare one. Um, and I'm really happy to say we have made great progress. We're discussing daycare at the institution for literally decades. And we're at a point, and uh, colleagues can note that, the directorate, uh, the Committee for Strategic Funding and Council are highly committed to address this challenge adequately. We have recently done a survey to establish what the needs are and our two task teams that deal with uh, the daycare arrangements at the Tigerberg campus and at the Stellenbosch campus will meet before the end of August to integrate the feedback from 
the surveys into a final application that we will submit again uh, to the to the rectorate and from there also report back to the to council we need to emphasize that on the one hand we uh, must ensure that there will be financial sustainability and that their hands should be sufficient participation by colleagues in using daycare facilities before uh, we can totally proceed uh, with, with providing especially a separate facility at, at Tigerberg. Uh, so th that is uh, one facet and we also have to at this stage also take the uncertainty of COVID time into consideration. But we are thankful this is really the furthest that we could make progress in many years and uh, 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 we have a spirit of uh, positiveness about where we are. Then with regard to the HR review, we uh, will receive the final report from the external consultants conferry at the end of August and then we will in September, early September, submit that report to the rectorate. Uh, we also in June, already middle of June, uh, tabled a progress report to the rectorate and we are glad that in September uh, we will come to conclusion uh, with this external review process and the aim is that we really hope that this, not hope, but we are committed that what we learn from this report will advance the challenge and the aim to be an HR of functional excellence. That's the model that the rectorate opted for and uh, we will in September have a final report. And then about the leave, uh, this is one of the arrangements uh, uh, chair that I referred to in my brief presentation. We had to look at leave arrangements during COVID time and last uh, week or two weeks ago actually we sent out a communique with guidelines uh, about how we can use leave. We are in the situation that we must work for sustainability at the institution as one of our major aims and therefore we cannot have a situation where leave accumulate. We really and I hope that colleagues can see until now the university is strongly committed to really have measures during COVID time that reflect fairness to colleagues and to the institution and that specifically also reflect uh, compassion and within that framework we uh, had to uh, 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 formulate the measures that you did receive that we must start using the, the leave over the next few months starting 1st of August and if there are specific questions regarding leave uh, colleagues are welcome to contact the human resources practitioner or even uh, uh, people like the Chief Director, colleague Victor Motobi, uh, or myself, um, and we can give more uh, in, uh, illumination and explanation. Yeah, yeah, thank you very much, Prof. Nico, for that. And I would really encourage uh, folks to uh, look at and read through the communiques that are issued following the ICBC meetings. Uh, that occur on a weekly or two weekly basis because they deal with many of these issues that our staff and students are struggle, struggling with or need questions on. So look at the COVID-19 webpage, look at the communiques that come from there uh, because many of the different uh, work streams deal with that. For example, there's a question, uh, what is the university's stance towards the return to campus? Will the university encourage staff and students to return as soon as possible or rather encourage all to study away for as long as possible? So we have very specific guidelines with regard to that. So as far as staff are, uh, are concerned, uh, we are encourage, encouraging folks to, and it's, and it's context specific, dependent on their various uh, environments, but really to, if possible, to do as much of uh, your work 
uh, from home, and especially if you're in either age categories or have comorbidity, comorbidities that uh, could uh, uh, put you into into some some danger. But again, their their guidelines and their work plans, their uh, environmental for your different environments, their work plans that the faculty administrators have also drawn up and your supervisors have drawn up that will really determine when and where you you uh, should and uh, work and, and when you can come back. For example, I have not been back to the office since the 26th of March, but we'll do that uh, increasingly uh, now um, when, when needed and especially when important face-to-face -face meetings have to take place. As far as our students are concerned, we know that a third of them are now allowed to come back on campus. That's uh, uh, predominantly uh, postgraduate students and those who need to finish uh, certain practical requirements to so that they can complete their, uh, their degrees uh, and their qualifications. And uh, as the registrar also noted that we have an increasing number of of, of students coming back to residences as well. Not as many as we actually thought we would, but um, we have uh, something like 1,600 in, in residences now, but we'll also issue uh, invitations to, especially to students who have difficulty with connectivity and with studying uh, from, uh, from home so that they um, uh, can do, complete their year successfully. But the point is we are certainly acting within the uh, provisions of, of the regulations uh, and, and that we're allowed to do. Um, the, um, I, I, uh, Nico, I think you've already addressed the question on the independent report on HR and the HR review that will, uh, that will be completed. If not, you can come in on that. There was a question uh, regarding the uh, recently uh, publicized um, uh, uh, initiative to have a look at the Wilcox building and uh, a, a, a name change of the Wilcox uh, uh, building. Uh, and uh, Dr. Ratif provided a link here for more information in this regard, both in Afrikaans and English, and that is on uh, this, the sun.ac.za uh, website, the, the motivation why we are looking at a possible change uh, for the for the Wilcox building. Um, there is a um, Nico. Did you did you want to say anything more more about the HR review? You you're muted. Okay. That's the, the phrase of COVID. You're muted. Yeah, and uh, yeah, what the director doesn't mean now is that we've agreed on a five rent penalty and it, every time when you speak and you don't unmute yourself. So five rents uh, for the student funds. Uh, no, a uh, chair, the, the report is a report that will be submitted to the rectorate. And I think the rectorate could then also decide uh, what elements thereof um, can be communicated. Uh, uh, it was a report that looked internally at how can uh, we, what should we do to make sure that we advance uh, within our HR division, but also broader in our HR practices, how can we make progress toward the, uh, towards the point of functional excellence and the rectorate could discuss what, what can be made more what would be meaningful to make uh, available more publicly to colleagues. Uh, so so I think uh, after we've submitted it in September, the rectorate can take the decision then. Okay, thank you very much. So I'm going to bring this Q&A session to a close, but I do want to promise you that those folks who uh, put questions, uh, submitted questions by email, you will get a, you will get a response. So, Colleagues, thank you so much for a very positive attitude during this crisis. Immense pressure, uncertainty. Uh, I think uh, our institution, we achieved a lot in a short space of time. We've also learned a lot together. Uh, and it is very good preparation for the challenges that still lie ahead. Because, as I've said before, 
we are clearly running a marathon and this is not a sprint. So we've built up some stamina, but we still have a long way to go. And now it's that that point in the race where you be starting to hit the wall at about 36 Ks or so. And it's a question of mind over matter. So it's persistence, perseverance, resilience. It takes a lot, both physically and mentally. But I think as a, as a team, and if we continue to work as a team, I have no doubt that we shall overcome. But we need to take good care of ourselves and also of one another. Um, I really, I want to close the meeting now, but I want you to stay on for a great performance by our world champion choir, SU Choir. Um, they still hold the top position in the uh, intercultural ranking for amateur choirs. Uh, they, the lockdown resulted in the cancellation of their international tour. They'll defend this title. It's been postponed until next year, the World Choir Games in Belgium. But even apart, as you'll see, they remain in harmony and they made headlines with this uh, beautiful virtual performance recently. You can also find it on YouTube. So, so thank you very much. Oh.